And they're followed by Poker School, Zaliapur, Ambo Roma, and then Mines. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off Track Betting. Broadcasting live from the Capital OTB Studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning and welcome to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning. Seth Merrill and Sully Karate. Sully, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Very good. Happy to be talking about a nice day of racing yet. Well, nice day as far as the races. I guess at Oaklawn it was <laughs> not too nice. Uh, I got a text from Steve Vick during the day that it was a little bit miserable down there. And we talked to our colleague Brian Addo during the afternoon. And he confirmed it was a rough day down there. We had talked to Nancy Holthus on Friday, uh, played that interview yesterday uh, during racing across america and she said friday was going to be a gorgeous day and saturday did not not so much so and, and brian uh, confirmed that he said friday was gorgeous and uh, yesterday down at oakland cool uh wet and brian said the wind was really mm -hmm. whipping it as well but there was good racing uh, on the track the three stakes all played out nicely we'll take a look uh, at those as we go along but it was a nice uh, afternoon of racing at the various venues with nice stakes at Keeneland we'll look at too but a couple of races that had the potential to play into the derby points the Lexington didn't as it uh, played out but we now do have the top 20 on the leaderboard yeah and you know I, I, I still even after yesterday um, I, I don't have I don't have a favorite. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to take a while for me to pinpoint uh, one horse that I actually will like uh, in this spot. But as you said, even with the weather, I think that's a one to, that's one plus for not having a turf course. I don't have to worry about that. All the races will stay the same unless um, you know a vet scratch or a trainer wants to scratch. So it was a really nice day down at Oaklawn. As you, and, and as you said, Keeneland had a really nice card uh, on Saturday as well. Friday had a really nice card yeah. as well. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like every other day at Keeneland has a nice card because the <laughs> meet is so short. So, uh, but all in all, just a really nice day of racing and Kentucky Derby preps are finally over and now we do know the 20 horses that uh, will be in there on the first Saturday of May. The horse that, uh, you know, you say you're searching, the horse that I, over the past couple of weeks I thought might be interesting was Spinoff and I was interested to see what was going to happen yesterday because Spinoff was sitting in a position where he could have gotten knocked out of the top mm -hmm. 20 with the results and just kind of lucked out. Um, the leaderboard that Churchill sent out the middle of the week had both the Japanese runner and the European runner on it. I assume the European connections have opted out because the updated leaderboard that was sent out last night didn't have the European runner anymore. So the Japanese runner, and they, they're not points, there were automatic races that allowed the Japanese runner or the European runner to come in. So they weren't points, so the Japanese runner is listed at number 20. That makes spinoff uh, at the end of the day yesterday, number 19, which as I say, I'm lucky on two counts. The European runner seems to have opted out, but more importantly, another twist of fate didn't win the, the Lexington mm -hmm. had yesterday. That yeah. would have leapfrogged him uh, over um, uh, spinoff and knocked my, uh, my perhaps clever look uh, out of the mix. So uh, I had my fingers crossed yesterday. It worked out. I may have a horse that I'll latch onto for uh, the Kentucky Derby and spinoff, just trying to be clever maybe. Yeah, I, and, you know, I, I did like spinoff in the Louisiana Derby. Uh, but so, you know, I, I, it's good to see some of those other horses get in that ran competitive races. But, you know, usually uh, in years past would not have enough points to get in. So uh, it's a really competitive field. And I did see um, a tweet this morning I thought was really interesting. Bob Baffert's got three horses in, and not including the Los Alpha 30, he won one prep race. And, it, and he beat his other horse. So it's it's a weird derby this year. But, um, you know, I think Omaha Beach is most likely going to be the favorite. But 
Mike Smith's got a tough choice to make with Omaha Beach or uh, to ride roads there. Yeah, I'm going to be interested to see how it does shake out. After yesterday, it won't surprise me if Omaha Beach winds up the favorite. But Roadster being a Baffert horse, I still think a lot of Derby folks are going to look at Baffert and just the magic he's had mm -hmm. uh, on the Triple Crown Trail the last few years. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And as you say, Mike Smith has a very – it'll be interesting to see where he goes, <laughs> yeah. uh, certainly. And that may tilt people in one direction or another. All right, we will t do some stakes recaps uh, on today's show. We'll also do a little bit of handicapping. And then uh, towards the end of the hour, last 20 minutes or so, we'll be joined by Gary West. Haven't talked to Gary in quite a while. Uh, Longtime racing writer for the Dallas – well, a couple of newspapers – in Dallas, but he is, uh, more importantly for our discussion, a voter on the weekly NTRA polls. Uh, so I thought we'd reach out to Gary uh, and get his thoughts on the, the Arkansas Derby yesterday, but also uh, the poll that comes out tomorrow, the NTRA poll, I'll be interested to see how he's placed his three-year-olds going into uh, tomorrow, given that now the Derby points leaderboard is all set. Let me hit you with some promos before we get into the replays, just because there's a couple of interesting ones coming up. Friday, the bankroll returns. I'll have another $500. It was brutal a couple of weeks ago uh, when, well, actually, it's just over a week ago, uh, when uh, live to four horses in the pick four at Aqueduct for between, I think, $1,400 and $4,400 ran second. Luckily, we backed up a little bit with the 7-1 to one winner, had a $40 win bet. So we made money on the day, and everybody walked away with a little bit of change, but not as, not as much as we were hoping. But we'll do it again on, uh, coming up on Friday right here at the Clubhouse Racebook. So keep that in mind for the end of the week. We would love to see you down here. Also, the next Saturday, there's the Fan Appreciation Day at the Sampson's Easy Bet branch. So if you're a patron uh, out in that direction, Sampson's on Saturday, Easy Bet. We'd love to see you there so we can uh, say thank you to you on a Fan Appreciation Day, again, coming up next Saturday. All right, ready to jump into some of the replay, Sully? Absolutely. And the first one uh, goes back to Friday night. I stayed up late just to, to watch it. Well, <laughs> I stayed up. I'm a late-night person anyway, so it was, it was actually right in my wheelhouse. But about 1 o'clock, 1.05 on uh, Friday night our time, that would have been about 3 in the afternoon, uh, in Australia. They were running the Queen Elizabeth, and it was notable because the career finale for the incredible Winx, we're going to show the whole race in just a second, a mile and a quarter, and I'm just looking at the PPs, and the race just before that, she ran seven and a half furlongs. The race just before, a mile. The race just before that, seven furlongs. The two races before that, a mile and a quarter. The Friday night race ended her career. It was her 33rd straight win. It was her 21st grade one win. Uh, an incredible career for the eight-year-old mayor. She hadn't lost a race in four years. Um, I, and as I say, sprints uh, goes a mile and a quarter. She had won the, the Cox Plate four times. I'm looking at some of the results here. Uh, Cox Plate four times to George Ryder four times. The George Main Stakes three times. Uh, she, the Queen Elizabeth that she won on Friday night, that was her third time winning that race. Chipping Norton Stakes, she won four times. These are all top races down there in Australia. The Cox Plate, certainly one of the top races. So it's like, it's, uh, you know, having an eight-year-old mayor here that wins the, the Woodward four times or the Clark or the Santa Anita Handicap. Uh, just a, an incredible career capped off on Friday and why don't we take a look at the race. She'll be the number seven horse. She leaves from the outside post position and it was fun watching. Uh, it was The whole lead up was fun. I mean it was a crowd, it was a sellout crowd. Um, they were going nuts but the the starting gate was obviously in the back of the course and there was a fence there like similar to the fence you see outside of Saratoga you know steel bars but uh, it was the back of the course with a roadway next to it and it was lined with people just watching her go into the <laughs> gate. It was that kind of a historic day. But she leaves from the outside post. And as they come out of the turn and head into the stretch, you'll pick her up easily. She's in blue, blue cap. But she starts to make a move and goes wide coming into the stretch and makes that nice stretch run on the outside. So uh, we'll take a look now. The career finale for the phenomenal eight-year-old mayor, Winks. This was Friday night our time, Saturday afternoon down in Australia. The Queen Elizabeth Stakes down at Randwick. Take a look at uh, the career wrap-up. Of the most illustrious career in racing. And Winks completes the lineup. 
The red light is on and the crowd are ready to send her off and the gates open. They're off from the Queen Elizabeth. Massive roar to the crowd. She's going to settle in last winks. And Hartner was first out. Masked times mustering. So is Harlem. Happy clapper handy. He's eminence back last. Kluger runs handy fifth and Winks is moving forward. Bowman wants a better spot. Gets in front of Shalali. He's eminence back second last. Many thought he would lead. Dance, dance, dance is last. Basket time goes to the mile. Has the lead all on his own here from Harlem. And Hartnell's got the box seat third. Two off then to the eight-year-old Happy Clapper. Two further back to Kluger. And there's Winks. One off the fence now. Has he's eminent in a pocket back on the fence. Then came Shalali. And Dan's 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 Ten off the leaders last. It's the big roughy. Masked time in front of the 1200. Out by two links on Harlem. Hartnell with a great run third. Two off to Happy Clapper. Then came Kluger. Three quarters the outside. Wings, very relaxed in the run. Bowman sitting very quiet. He's eminent back. McDonald just easing back a little bit. It looks as though he's trying to find a way out off the fence. Then came Shalali and Dan's 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 last. No surprises yet. They've got 900 to run. Masked time a length clear from Harlem. Then Hartnell, happy clapper. Now he starts the run on Wings. He's starting to move forward. Just shading Kluger. Then he's eminent still positioned back on the inside of Shalali and Dan. Dance, 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 coming to the turn. The roughing mask of time, two lengths clear. Hartnell goes to second, giving chase. Now happy clapper, and Winks is rounding them up, coming right around the field. Fluger takes an inside run. She's gone for home already, Winks. She beats off Hartnell. Fluger going up the inside. Happy clapper can't go on. Winks is two lengths clear. Fluger sticks on. Then came Hartnell, but she's well clear, Winks, inside the final hundred. Australian icon, the greatest of all time. Winks wins her third, Queen Elizabeth beats Kluger, Hartnell third, Happy Clapper fourth, then Shalali, Mask of Time, further back to He's Eminent, not a factor in the race from Dan's Dan's Dance and Harlem finished tailed off. The story is complete. This is what we wanted. Yikes, and she makes it look easy. She swings up on the outside. Five wide, gets set down in the stretch. Kluger second, and the very talented Hartnell runs third. But uh, what a way to go out. As I said, the three races prior to this one, seven and a half, a mile, seven. And she goes out with a mile and a quarter victory. She can sprint. She can go the, uh, the uh, longer distances. And just, uh, a, again, a phenomenal career for Winks. It, you know, it really was. You can't say enough. No, about her career, 33 wins in a row, and it just, it just doesn't make sense, and especially in horse racing, it just does not make sense, all the success she's had and all those wins in a row, so she will be missed, but uh, she went out uh, with a really nice performance, as you said, just so wide on the turn, and looked like she still had a little bit left at they asked her to give it uh if they asked her uh, to give a little bit more she definitely looked like she had some left yeah watching the uh again the live broadcast friday night they uh, talked to trainer chris chris waller after the race and he was emotional i mean you have a horse like this yeah. you're definitely emotional when they leave the barn uh hugh bowman the jockey had comments after the race too and he had, t- had taken the horse up the track and back and uh, so everybody in the grandstand got a look at her uh, for the career finale but uh, again the beauty of the internet now we can watch and appreciate horses like this on completely the other side of the world and in fact you can enjoy it right here on the network too as we did have it live uh, on Friday night so hopefully you, you enjoyed that and if you missed it live uh, you enjoyed the uh, rebroadcast here uh, because boy it was a phenomenal way to uh, wind up in a, a phenomenal career again 33rd straight victory 25th uh, grade one, so incredible uh, performance by Winks on Friday night our time. All right, speaking of Friday, let's go back to a couple of stakes uh, here in the United States on Friday, and let's kick things off by taking a look at the Maker's Mile, typically one of the uh, better races on the stake schedule for the spring at Keeneland. This year, no exception. We're going to watch the uh, stretch run here. It will be the number four Delta Prince getting it done for Stronic and Jimmy Jerkins. Clyde's image at 46 to 1 as the rank outsider, the number seven horse, runs second for Tommy Bush. 
and Kirban runs third, the number five for Kieran in Shadwell. But Delta Prince, uh, again, a talented turfer for Jimmy Jerkins, was coming out of a third in the Pegasus World Cup Turf Invitational. We had seen uh, uh, Delta Prince last summer uh, up in Woodbine win the King Edward. Uh, we were up there that weekend, Queen's Plate weekend, and it was a nice performance uh, on the turf up there. Subsequently, a near miss in the four-star day. They went back up for the Woodbine Mile, and again, we were there for that as well. A little bit disappointing running fourth uh, in that one. Tried the dirt uh, to end the season last year. And again, the third place finish down at Gulfstream to start this season, but now uh, the nice win in the Makers Mile uh, Grade 1 event. So uh, certainly a nice little star on the resume for the six-year-old for Jimmy Jerkins and Stronic. And again, they'll have a player in that uh, division on the turf throughout the year, you would think, with Delta Prince. Yeah, and, you know, it's and Javier is just, been riding unbelievably down. Yeah, what, Keeneland, what, 53%, I think. Yeah, I'm looking at the daily, yeah, 53%. So, uh, and Brian Nettos, uh, <laughs> buddy, is, is, has become his agent and uh, uh, tip of the cap. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're, they're a clear, he's clearly finding the good mounts. <laughs> hey, he definitely is. And Delta Prince, as you said, we saw in the wood by a mile. It was a little disappointing there. Um, but the four star Dave ran a really big race against Voodoo Song. Uh, so it. it Looking at the, the racing form going into the race, it was going to be interesting to see who was going to go off as the favorite, Raging Bull or Delta Prince. And it, it happened to be Delta Prince. Raging Bull took a ton of money uh, for Chad Brown as well. I thought that it was a great race by Delta Prince. I thought Heart to Heart was a little bit disappointing there, defending champion in that race. But they went 24-2 and two and then up to 47-7. and seven. Uh, Julian looked like he had a little bit left, but it was just, I thought, disappointing there for Heart to Heart. On the but, blast. Uh, just not... Not to take anything away from Delta Prince and Javier. So, um, and if you like the horse, you put the horse out of the field, you got rewarded with a 47 to 1 horse underneath. Yeah, and again, Tommy Bush saw so some New York players certainly may have uh, stuck that one in the mix. What's the exacta for a buck? He got back just under $90. So, yeah, hopefully some New York betters did jump on board there. All right, let's move on to uh, Oaklawn on Friday. Again, Festival of the South, so lots of great stakes races all weekend long, including today with the Apple Blossom. But uh, Friday, we're the three-year-old Phillies in the fantasy going a mile and a 16th. We're going to watch the stretch run. It will be the number four Lady Apple getting it done for Steve Asmussen. Six to one on the morning line, went off at nine to one. The favorite was Motion Emotion. Mike Smith on board for Tom Van Berg. Motion Emotion coming out of a second place finish in the Honey Bee after a couple of wins prior to that. But the number eight horse can only uh, do as well as second. Number nine Brill runs third in here at three to one. But again, nice little run from uh, Lady Apple for Asmussen. Third career win in the seventh career start. I'm just looking, though, Sully, at the numbers. I don't know what the number was on Friday, uh, the buyer, but the numbers otherwise just are a little bit light. The maiden break or two back was pretty good, otherwise a little bit light. So I'm uh, thinking, yeah, I'm not quite sure how the fantasy is going to play into the Kentucky Derby. The fact of the matter is, I'm not sure, other than the race uh, last week out at Santa Anita, how any of the three-year-old Philly preps will play in because I think Bella Fina has this group over yeah. a barrel. <laughs> yeah, she, Bella Fina is definitely uh, the real deal there. But as you said, you know, I, the connections went a lot of races down at Oakland and it, and it was Aspie Sin and, and Ricardo. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they kicked off, as you said, the great weekend in the right way. But, you know, I was looking at that race as well. I wasn't even, I wasn't thrilled with the favorite in that race either. I thought maybe you can get a little, uh, a little bit uh, tricky with some better prices, but I did not look towards Lady Apple. So, congratulations there to uh, Steve Asmussen and Ricardo Santana. And Ricardo did win the meet last year at Oakland. Steve Asmussen, as we said, has had a lot of success down in Arkansas the last couple of years. So, uh, nine to one price. So, if you're just betting those two alone, uh, you again got rewarded with almost twenty two dollars. Yeah. So, uh, and again, they've had a nice weekend. We'll see a little more of that as we progress. All right, let's move on and uh, take a look at the action from yesterday. Kind of work our way back from the grade one Jenny Wiley. Uh, that was race 10 on the card yesterday. And uh, clearly all eyes on rushing fall for Chad Brown. Uh, six wins and seven career starts, three for three over the uh, Keeneland turf course. This was the seasonal debut, hadn't been seen since the Queen Elizabeth II at Keeneland last fall, last October. So. Would the horse be ready to go off the layoff? 
The answer, yes. Number two, rushing fall. Did get a little bit, you kind of thought at the top of the stretch, got stormy, the number seven was going to go on by. It looks like here, has some momentum, but rushing fall says no. And then number four, Rimska goes to the rail, and you think, well, maybe that this one has her. And again, rushing fall just resolute and holds them both off. So it's a Chad Chad exacto with rushing fall over Rimska and uh, got stormy for Mark Cassie runs third in here. But like I say, you, there was a two-pronged attack. Uh, got stormy, you definitely thought was going to go by as they got a, a couple of hundred yards into the stretch. Just uh, it seems like rushing fall maybe picked up on both of those horses and says, not today. So this was a pretty good looking seasonal debut for rushing fall. It, it absolutely was. And as you said, rushing fall has had a lot of success over that Keeneland turf course. And once again, Javier gets it done in a graded stakes at Keeneland. So uh, I thought Rimska, you know, Rimska was, I thought watching the replay even again, I was surprised Rimska didn't go by because the that bolt towards the rail looked like Irad had a lot left in that horse. And I like the horse coming in from Tampa Bay to pull off the upset against the the, uh, the other Chad runner. So uh, Chad runs one, two, one, two, and four in this spot. Uh, but a really nice game effort by a rushing fall to get it done. And four for four now over that Keeneland turf course. So, uh, and as you said, a really nice seasonal debut uh, for that E5 runner. Yeah, she's a solid player in the female turf division this year, obviously. All right, let's take a look at the Lexington. Um, again, this had the potential. There were a couple of horses in here that uh, could have picked up enough points to move themselves into the Kentucky Derby. Uh, we mentioned earlier Twist of Fate, um, and that one sits uh, kind of bubble-wise, 23. But Sueno also could have gotten in. That one sits in the bubble at 24. Um, but a win would have put uh, either one of those in. They could not get it done, though. Owendale gets it done with a little bit of an upset. The number eight horse for Brad Cox. Another twist of fate. A horse I think a lot of people like coming out of that race down at Sunland. Gets up for second as the uh, seven to five favorite. The number four horse in Soweno, the Keith DeSormo runner, who again I think a lot of people thought was a little bit interesting. Can do no better than third at seven to two. But Owendale gets it done, as I say, for Brad Cox. Had tossed in a dud in the uh, Risen Star. A little optional claiming win before that down at the fairground. Said this could be a little bit of a runner. But again, off the Risen Star performance, you had to think, hmm, maybe stepping up against uh, Stakes Company was not in the, the cards. But rebounded nicely. And now you have to think that Risen Star was maybe a little bit of an aberration for Owendale. But... All of that said, we'll see where they go next with this one because Owendale, uh, with the win, I think uh, just has the the uh, 20, uh, 20 points. Yeah, so 29 on the list. Owendale won't be headed uh, to Churchill for the first Saturday in May, but with a rebound now becomes a little bit of a player on the three-year-old uh, scene. And, and I think pretty much the complexion of this field, Beyond maybe another twist of fate, who I think was maybe good enough to give a shot to the Kentucky Derby, probably on the outside looking in now, as they say, a bubble horse about three away would need, and things can shake out, so that one could get in, you would think. But another twist of fate, maybe Soweno, I think, had shown enough where you could make the argument, hmm, they, they could have held their own in the Kentucky Derby. The rest of these, I think, had the look of those kind of horses that can maybe pick their spots and go on those kind of B-level three-year-old stakes racing, you know, Ohio Derby and those kind of races throughout the year. And Owendale may be one of those. Yeah, and as you said, the, coming in from the fairgrounds, it was not a great performance at all. But uh, I, I knew some people that really did th thought the horse had a chance to run big but not win because, it, as you said, another twist of fate coming in from that Sunland Derby ran a monster race there. Um, and needed the points to get into the Kentucky Derby starting gate. So uh, disappointing there for the connections. And, you know, I thought Nick's go ran an okay race, and that horse kind of faded off and ups was an upset at the spring meet at Keeneland last year at 70-1. to one. Harvey Wallbanger as well uh, took some money because of that holy ball performance and the amount of speed in this race. You thought maybe Harvey Wallbanger could show a closing kick, kind of was disappointing in that race. So, um Owendale, and as you said, you know, the, it, it's tough to win at the fairgrounds, especially in those deep fields. So um, I, I do think the lower tier of those graded stakes after the Triple Crown Series, Owendale will be a big player in those. So we'll see. Maybe the, 
Brad Cox will, will take a shot maybe at, at the Preakness and in, in Baltimore, who knows? So, uh, but a really nice performance there and a disappointing for another twist of fate who did look good coming into this race. Yeah, and I say second tier, you're right. Some of these may aim for the Preakness because then the crop sorts itself out a little bit. You have definitely the Derby winner coming back, but a lot of the others will say, you know what, we're going to hold off uh, until another spot down the road. And so it wouldn't surprise me if some of these wound up showing up in the Preakness. All right, let's take a look at the Ben Ali for the older division down at Keeneland on a Friday grade three event. Boy, this race kind of fell apart. I uh, liked Flame Away. Flame Away, the uh, number four horse, is going to be in the mix until the end as the two to one favorite and wind up running sixth. Hence, the uh, Aspusen runner runs eighth. Sola Mini for Baffert runs fifth. Um, and it's a little bit of an upset. Bourbon Resolution, the number nine horse, wins at 18 to one. Nonetheless, gets up for second at nine to one. Third day at seven to one runs third in here bourbon resolution it makes it look easy chart margin of four and a half and again at uh, 18 to one probably got away at a little bit uh, more generous odds than was deserved ran third last time at five to two in a little stake down at tampa won a couple of races uh prior to that at Gulfstream and churchill and optional claimer so there was a little bit of talent here um you know, deserve to be one of the uh, longer prices. But again, the 18 to one, $38 and 60 cents was a prob probably a little more generous than was deserved. But as I say, boy, the logicals in here just kind of fell apart. Bonus points, the, the Pletcher horse runs ninth in the field of 10 as it kind of blows up a little bit with uh, the $38 horse on top for one dollar exact 187 bucks so again it fell apart a little bit in the ben ali yeah and bourbon resolution i i did like in that tampa bay race i had fourth in my mix on the stakes preview but ran a really big credible race and ian wilkes and, and chris landeros they have been number one they've had a great meet at at keeneland but on these big cards ian wilkes always has one of these horses that can can blow up these multiples a little bit and that's what happened there but i was with you i've always liked flame away i liked flame away at saratoga uh in the gym dandy i liked flame away in the kentucky, going into the kentucky derby uh, after the performance in the like in the bluegrass last year so uh a disappointing uh, result there yesterday for Flame Lake, especially coming in such a nice win at Tampa Bay Downs. Uh, so uh, disappointing there. Salamini, I thought was a little bit of a wild card in there as well. Uh, but again, 18 to one for a horse that really didn't have a bad outing last time. So you got rewarded if you did like this this horse as well, almost forty dollars. And uh, as you said, an exacta for a buck came back 187. So uh, congrats there to all the connections of Bourbon Resolution. Older division down at Oaklawn on Saturday, the Oaklawn Handicap. Uh, it's the number seven quip for Rudolph Brissett. Uh, came out of a third place finish in the House Hope behind Prince Lucky and Coppertown. Uh, that was a layoff since the Preakness. So this was really second start back off a long layoff. Benefited from that House Hope. Number seven quip wins. Number eight lone sailor. Uh, just a neck behind and pioneer spirit. Just a neck behind that one. It's the first five spots. Neck, 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 neck. This was a uh, cavalry charge to the wire, but Quip does hold them off at 5-1. to one. Again, for Rudolph Brissett, uh, Windstar, China Club, and others. Um, rated our superstar, who was coming out of the win in the Essex, winds up six. The favorite was tenfold for uh, Steve Asmussen. Two to one favorite winds up seventh in here. So again, a little bit of an upset uh, in the uh, Oakland handicap as well. Yeah, and in the stakes preview, I did like Long Sailor, so I was watching that race, and I knew live. It ran well. It ran very well there. Uh, I knew that race live, I would be in a little bit of trouble. I just liked that Fairgrounds race Long Sailor came out of, uh, and, and Quip was a little disappointing first time out after a really nice three-year-old year. So, you know, you got, you got rewarded there for really nice connections that seem to be winning everything, including last year in the, on the Triple Crown Trail, and they just seem like they've won they have a big win every weekend so quip nice price there but i was watching that live i thought lone sailor you know could potentially go by but the wire just came quickly so um 
this was a nice race. Tenfold a little disappointing, as you said. Rated R Superstar, I think we kind of got uh, the best out of that horse paying 30-something dollars. So uh, this was a nice field, but uh, Quip with really nice effort to win. And as you said, not very often do you see a neck, 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 neck separating <laughs> the top five. Uh, and finally, want to look at uh, what was one of the more fun races of the weekend, even though there was only a field of five. I talked about this yesterday with Nancy Holthus, the uh, Count Fleet. Only a field of five, but Matole and Whitmore were set to uh, kind of duke it out and be real players in this uh, sprint division this year. I like Whitmore. The horse uh, had shown a real affinity for the course. Whitmore's the number four. You think at the top of the stretch he's going to go by and get it done, but uh, on the inside is Matole. It does come down to those two as expected, but Matole off a seasonal debut and an optional claimer that was very impressive impresses again and it's uh more from asmussen and santana on their big weekend look at matoli at uh, whitmore it's a solid mm -hmm. solid stakes quality sprinter and uh the chart margin there two and three quarters as the two to five favorite whitmore went off at eight to five and again the top of the stretch you thought whitmore had a measured but matoli says no so this is a nice four-year-old uh, sprinter for steve asmussen as they say both of these will play in the sprint division this year yeah, they absolutely will, and I, as you said, it came down to those two, and we got a really nice race out of it, so, uh, and, and you said Ricardo already, and, and Steve Asterson again, had a big weekend down there, so, and I, I was watching that as well, I thought Whitmore was going to go by, and Matoli just had another gear left, so, uh, it, it came down to those two, and you got a really nice race out of it, so, um, Matoli and paid over uh, 280 there, so, and it came out of a really nice optional claimer. Yeah, your free square, as they say. Yes. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you liked Matole, as they say, I like Whitmore on the, the uh, affinity he'd shown for the surface, and he ran well, but boy, Matole was super impressive there yesterday. All right, why don't we take a break? When we come back, we'll do a little handicapping. And again, in yeah, 10 minutes or so, we'll be joined by our friend Gary West. We'll get some of his thoughts on this Derby Trail situation as we now kind of have solidified the uh, leaderboard with the points list and uh, all of that coming up right here on this edition of Racing Across America. Stay tuned. Here in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of branch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet, fund your Capital Bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. You'll get live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, a simple, safe and secure wagering platform, and best of all, you get track prices. CapitalOTBBet.com. Bet any place, anytime at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. What if there was a way to become a better horse player, to have a better knowledge of the game, to be more successful? What if there were a way to take what you've learned, what you know, and make better decisions, better choices, to know how to connect the dots? In horse racing, knowledge is a powerful tool, but not the only tool. Race results and replays, past performances and live streaming, wagering from all your digital devices, these two are important tools, and you'll find them all right here at Capital OTB. Capital OTB. Become a better horse player. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning. Seth Merrill and Sully Crotty. We just did a little stakes recap, and now preview some stakes on this Sunday. Some nice stakes uh, across the country, including the Apple Blossom down at Oaklawn. We'll take a look at that in a minute, but Sully's going to kick things off with the Tokyo City out at Santa Anita. That's race number six out in Southern California this afternoon. A mile and a half for the four-year-olds and up. Grade three event, they are vying for $100,000. How'd you see the marathon? Yeah, it, it's a short field here, but it's a really nice race uh, at Santa Anita. I, I went two, five, and one. I went with a little bit of a shot here because uh, Campaign and Beachview are going to take the, the money, the five and the one. And I went with the two. I like this horse coming in. Really nice form, but the one kicker people are going to be looking at is Rafael Bejarano decided to ride Campaign the number one. But this is a horse that's won 
four, four races in a row, has had some success over this surface and should be on the front end. There's not much other speed because of this marathon race. So uh, Victor Espinosa could just get an easy lead here and potentially run away from this group like we did see last time out on a sloppy track. So it's going to be interesting to see how this one takes to a fast track uh, for the first time in since February of 2018. So I'll take in a shot with a turf rider that's now on the main track, but just going to be on the lead. Um, the number five, Flavian Pratt, back in California for the Sunday races. Beach View, a horse that has a really nice closing kick. We saw that in the last couple of starts in grade two events. Was running against Gift Box and Battle of Midway and Dabster uh, the day after Christmas. But since then, it's been running decent races against some good company out in California. So we'll use Beachview, who should be the favorite in this spot over the number one campaign. Rafael Bejarano will be aboard for John Sadler, a horse that was in that uh, Santa Anita handicap earlier in the month against Gift Box and McKinsey. Uh, so I think a repeat of that 94 buyer against that type of field um, will have campaign a deserving favorite in here. But a short field uh, for the Tokyo City Cup. I went 2, 5, and 1. Seth's going to take a look at uh, a race in New York, the seventh race at Aqueduct. This is a $25,000 non-worn to three lifetime, and they're going one mile. Yeah, and I wanted to pick a dirt race because they were off the turf yesterday, and I haven't, you know, I checked before we went on there. I hadn't seen anything. Um, as far as today, I would assume with the weather yesterday, which was very nice down in New York, they're probably back on the turf. But again, I just didn't want to do a turf race and have things uh, shake up a little bit. So I, I went with a dirt race. I thought this one was interesting. I'm not super confident here, but a little bit of a price maybe. I, I'm not necessarily buying the morning line though, but just in case that holds up. Seventh at Aqueduct, I have it nine, three, four, and seven. Starship Zeus, 12 to one on the morning line, but being a buyer guy, the, the numbers underneath the last are good enough in here. It's a Charlie Baker uh, runner, so you know uh, how talented he is. Dylan Davis on board, who had a great winter season. And again, I think you have to draw a line through the last race, and uh, like uh, often you see, don't necessarily buy into one race. Either one race that's really good or one race that's really bad. Um, Sometimes it signals form going one way or the other, but sometimes it's just a little bit of an aberration, and that's what I'm kind of counting on here. So I'm going to draw a line through the last race. That was a drop down to this $25,000 level. Uh, so I'm looking at this as, mm, I'm discounting that one. So we'll give this one another shot at this reduced level for Charlie Baker. And again, if we get some, some value anywhere close to that 12 to 1 morning line, I think Starship Zeus... Very interesting. Korea's Brooklyn Law in the second spot. Again, on the numbers, uh, certainly fits nicely with this particular group. We're looking at 7-2 to two, uh, on the morning line. And uh, also getting some class relief. Claim uh, three starts back for 40. Goes for 25 today after a couple of starts at, uh, against better. So I think Korea's Brooklyn Law with the class relief and the numbers that compete well with this group is a player in here. Special story, again, the numbers I think stack up nicely with the better runners in this group, but the horse also has some very nice early speed that could be very potent uh, in here uh, and put this one out in front in, uh, in a catch me if you can kind of situation. Dooley, um, interesting, a, a little bit underneath. Uh, the top three are the ones that kind of jumped out at me and I was searching around and, and landed on the, the Dave Donk runner in the third spot, um, but Sandy Lane, Desert Lights, Flat Excel are horses that I all uh, considered in that third spot. But as I say, the top three kind of jump out at me. We'll see. I'm, I'm dubious that the morning line on Starship Zeus will hold up, but if so, maybe a little bit of value here in the seventh at Aqueduct. I have it nine, three, four, and seven. All right, we'll both jump in and take a look at the highlight on the Oaklawn card today. Again, this weekend is the Festival of the South. Typically, uh, in years past, this has wrapped up the uh, Oak Lawn meet. That's not the case this year, as they will go until Kentucky Derby Day. And as we said with Nancy Holthus, they have uh, the Arkansas Derby yesterday, but another nice three-year-old race uh, coming up on Kentucky Derby Day that will produce an automatic starter to the Preakness. So, again, still some time left on the Oak Lawn meet, which I'm happy about because I like playing Oak, Oak Lawn, find a lot of value there, but not only that, nice stakes action, a nice stakes action today with the Apple Blossom Grade 1 event, a half a dozen of the Phillies and Mayors in here 
going a mile and a sixteenth for three quarters of a million dollars, and only six. But uh, Sully, quantity and quality, quality over quantity, I guess, with only the half a dozen in here. But boy, you couldn't ask for two or three uh, of the uh, more prominent names in this division. And Midnight Beast, you in a late, and I suppose throwing in Wonder Gadot as well. Yeah, and. You know, I, that's the three I went with here. And, you know, I'm just trying to go master of the obvious here. I went Midnight Bizu on top. Hopefully, Elite goes off as the favorite there. And it would be a deserving favorite for Elite, the Bill Mount runner. Uh, but I just think the last couple for Midnight Bizu, including that win um, in the Cotillion from the DQ of Monomoy Girl, and even coming back in the Breeders' Cup, we're in a really nice third there. So I think Midnight Bizu is. I'm going to take that horse over you late in this spot. I'm going to try to split the two with one of good Um A little disappointing last time out, but lost to a nice horse and go Google yourself. Go Google yourself has been very competitive in some stakes races uh, before going into that optional claimer uh, in the beginning of March at Oakland. So I, I, I've always been a fan of her. She's a horse that needs her room to stretch her legs somewhere uh, in the race, and I think she'll get that with the short field and, and a horse that is going to be in a really nice stalking role. David Cohen, the leading jockey at the meet, will be in the irons for Mark Cassie and Gary Barber. And then the one, Elite, uh, this is a horse that ran so well at Saratoga in the personal ends and went down and lost by a length to Midnight Bizu last time out at Oaklawn. But her resume herself for Bill Ma is, is, is really nice. Winner of the Alabama uh, last 2017 so she's deserving favorite in here i'm just going to try to beat her with a little bit better prices uh with midnight bizu and one good though but uh in the apple blossom i went six five and one i went six one five three again we're kind of master of the obvious but did want to highlight this race as it is probably it is definitely the biggest race uh, on this sunday afternoon but i had midnight bizu over a late just on we saw it yesterday um it it just having watched races, it's anecdotal as opposed to scientific, but having watched races uh, over the years, uh, I just do believe oftentimes <coughs> we get clever and think, oh, horse X beat horse Y, but horse Y looked pretty good. So today I'm going to put horse Y over horse X. And more often than not, it happened, it comes out the same as it did in the previous race. And we saw that yesterday in the Arkansas Derby. I think a lot of folks thought, well, improbable will turn the tables. But no, Omaha Beach uh, got it done uh, there yesterday in the uh, uh, Arkansas Derby. And um, actually, uh, uh, improbable was in the other division. But it, it was one of those where came out of the second, you thought, oh, well, we'll switch things up. Doesn't happen. I think similarly, uh, Midnight Bijou won in the Azari. I think we're going to get the uh, similar result uh, this afternoon with Midnight Bijou over a late. Wonder if that, you know, you mentioned the nice uh, seasonal debut. I had Mark Cassie on with me uh, subsequent to that race, and we talked a little bit about it. And he kind of said, you know, I mean, people don't realize sometimes you just have to find a spot. She was ready to run. That's not really the spot we wanted, but we had to get a race into her. Um, so I think given that scenario, the second place finish was pretty good, probably sets her up for some improvement this afternoon. I'm not sure it's enough to, to get to these two who are going to be certainly real solid players in the Philly and Mayor division uh, this year. But Wonder that to me, is, again, a little bit interesting on the scenario from uh, Mark Cassie. So 6-1-5 and 3 for me. All right, we'll head to a break. When we come back, Gary West joins us. We'll talk a little Arkansas Derby and the three-year-old Derby trail scene overall. Please stay tuned. Not at the track and not near a computer? No problem. Wager with Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System and you'll never get shut out again. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System is quick, simple to use, and guarantees your wagers are accurate and placed on time. For more information, visit CapitalOTB.com or call Capital OTB's customer service hotline at 800-292-BETS. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System. Never get shut out again. But Game On Dude is just battling them all off. Game On Dude has the lead. Here's Drosselmeyer out of the clouds. Drosselmeyer from nowhere. And Drosselmeyer and Mike Smith have the 
Keegan Chantel Sutherland on Game On, dude. Visit Rivers Casino and Resort, the Capital Region's only destination for live table game action and the hottest new slots paying out millions. And they're off. Horse betting is now at Rivers Casino and Resort with Capital Off-Track betting terminals and live tellers located just off the gaming floor at Van Slicks. Get in on all the action at Rivers Casino and Resort. Welcome back to Racing Across America. In the studio, Seth Merrill and Sully Crowdy, and as promised before the break, joined now by our friend Gary West. I haven't talked to Gary in a while, but a longtime racing writer down in the Texas area, but I'm reaching out uh, today because... The points are in the books now. We know who the potential 20 are and the bubble horses. And uh, Gary is a voter on the NTRA weekly poll, so I wanted some of his thoughts uh, on the uh, Arkansas Derby in particular, but also just Derby thoughts with, uh, as I say, the points now settled. Gary, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Very good. Happy to talk to you. As I said, it's uh, been a while, but why don't we jump in and get some thoughts on that Arkansas Derby. You and I were talking before we went on the air Certainly the weather was a factor. And, and I talked with Nancy Holthus yesterday, and I was curious, uh, the morning line. Improbable was a, a slight 8-5 to five favorite over Omaha Beach. But I said, you know, when they go in the gate, I'm not going to be surprised with that sloppy track victory if Omaha Beach winds up the favorite. That's the way it ended up. Omaha Beach slightly favored at 8-5, to five, improbable at 9-5. to five. And it was those two dueling down the stretch. Now, we're watching them come out of the gate here. I will say, keep your eyes on the number three horse, Omaha Beach. On the back stretch, Mike Smith makes a big move. I love his aggressiveness. I love when jockeys say, I've got the horse. I'm going to make my move. He did that on the back stretch. And probable shortly after, moves up to engage. I thought long-range Toddy was interesting, the uh, number 11 horse. Coming to the far turn, that one kind of looms and, and I thought was going to be interesting. But about that time, the top two spurred away and defined themselves as the two that are going to play out. Long Range Toddy events eventually fades to uh, sixth in the field. And it does come down to Omaha Beach and Improbable with number three, Omaha Beach, getting it done. Improbable kind of looked to, to put up the challenge, just couldn't get there. But well clear to the third place horse, the Bill Mott uh, runner, Country House, who ran well for third, uh, being lightly raced. But as we watch him going down the back stretch now, give us your thoughts, your impressions on the Arkansas Derby. Well, you're right that Mike Smith made an aggressive move, and it turned out to be the winning move. And you're also correct in that Omaha Beach, having romped for his maiden win on the sloppy track, uh, did figure to be favored once the, uh, the rain fell on Hot Springs. And, and I thought he turned in what was perhaps the best performance we've seen so far on the Derby Trail, certainly one of the best. Um, but some skeptics will argue that the mud was a factor, and this is a horse that uh, loves an off-going. But at this point, the uh, no three-year-old has given a performance that would, in a typical year, be good enough to win the Kentucky Derby. Not, not a single one of them. On the other hand, there are about, by my estimation, 11 who are within reach of that kind of performance if they step forward at Churchill Downs. So it's going to be one of the most wide-open derbies uh, I think we've seen in a long time. And Omaha Beach is definitely one of those horses who's moving forward and seems capable of taking that next step. I thought he looked better, he, he ran better, he was even more impressive in this race than he was when he won the Rebel. And if he continues that progression, uh, he's going to be the horse to beat in Kentucky. And, of course, it's great to see a Hall of Fame cleaner like Richard Mandela go to Churchill Downs with such a live horse. He's been one of the greatest horsemen in the game for a long time, but he doesn't have a derby victory on his resume. Maybe he'll take care of that in a few weeks. Yeah, and I was watching the NBC broadcast yesterday, and they mentioned he hasn't had a derby horse since 2004, but they emphasized he just hasn't had that many horses that, that – have been players, and, and he's not a guy that pushes towards the Derby. So I think that's notable as well. As you say, a talented guy like this who is a little bit cautious and doesn't really get that Derby fever, it says something when he has a horse that's this talented and makes the Derby field. Right. He's the kind of trainer who won't push a horse to the Derby but will insist, if we're going there, the horse has to take me. And Omaha Beach is taking him there because this horse has steadily moved forward. 
very impressive performance there at Oklahoma Park. Again, though, was the factor, uh, was the uh, mud, the, the track condition, a contributing factor, perhaps so. But he's definitely one of the horses that you uh, have to put at the top of the list of contenders at Churchill Downs. Let, let me see if you agree with me. Uh, I, I have said the past few weeks, I've said for the last month and a half, I think this crop is a lot like last year where uh, it, somebody stepped up and looked good, but then four weeks later couldn't validate that and somebody new stepped forward and it was just tough. You know, Justify was the cream that rose to the top last year, but I think the, the, the crop got a little bit exposed as we went through the Triple Crown. Later in the season, horses like Catholic Boy came up and, and gave a little validity to a three-year-old scene. But again, I think the, the season's playing out a lot like last year, and you've kind of alluded to it. I said on the show a couple weeks ago, uh, you and I were both voters on the, the ESPN Derby poll, and every week you'd have to come up with that top ten. I said, and you're doing it with the NTRA poll, but I said, I'd have a tough time coming up with a ten this year. I agree. Um, at many of these performances... Uh, are are so close that, that they're difficult to separate. Um, it's it's a it's a very subjective thing. Do you put Omaha Beach number one after yesterday's race? I uh, certainly could make that argument. Although of course Vacoma, he had a, a big win at the Bluegrass. He won by three and a half over a pretty good field. Um, and, but but that wasn't quite as fast a race. I, I thought. Um, Tacitus ran a big race in the wood. You could put him on top as well. And, of course, the Baffert fans will go for Roadster, maybe even Game Winner, who uh, I thought ran a winning race in the Santa Anita Derby but had a wide trip. But the point is they're all so close together that the horse that can move forward, that will thrive under the very stressful conditions of the Kentucky Derby, is the horse that's going to win. It's going to be the horse that runs the best race of his life on May 4th. And let's go back. You mentioned Tacitus, and I, I was looking at the, the voters' uh, breakout from the NTRA poll from last week. You had Tacitus on top, game winner second, Omaha Beach third, Roadster fourth, and probable fifth. And let's take a look at that stretch run uh, to the Wood Memorial. We were down there last week covering this race, and I had said uh, that I was kind of at the winner's circle standing behind a group of people and didn't see the, the action in the first turn, and we're picking it up on the far turn here. But again, people should remember that the far outside horse took the left turn and really affected the majority of the field, including Tacitus, the number two horse who we're watching here, who got bumped around on that first turn. So that, to me, kind of stood out that he overcame that. And then a nice gutsy stretch run here, as we're seeing, to win by a chart margin of a length and a quarter. What was your takeaway for the wood from the wood that uh, allowed you to put Tacitus on top last week? Well, like you, I was impressed that he overcame trouble to win. And also impressed that this is another one of those horses that seems to be improving and improving. I've seen him work twice, and he's never impressed uh, in the mornings. Uh, but he, he knows his business, and uh, he, he definitely uh, is moving forward and, and is, I think, uh, going in the right direction. Another Hall of Fame trainer going to the Derby with a, with a legitimate contender, another Hall of Fame trainer, Bill Mott, in this case, who's one of the greatest horsemen of our time, but hasn't had a derby winner. So that's, that's very good to see. But I was impressed that he overcame trouble in the wood, and that was a, a fast-paced race as opposed to, let's say, the Santa Anita Derby, which um, uh, wasn't uh, necessarily, or, or even worse, the Florida Derby, where maximum security just got uh, an easy lead and, and was walking on the front end. But um, Tacitus comes out of a fast-paced race, and I really like the fact that he runs the turn well. Um, as I, I point out every year, the winning move in the Kentucky Derby is usually made around the second turn. The winner typically will make up more ground um, from the from the three eighths pole to the uh, or the, the half mile pole to the quarter pole than from the quarter pole to the wire. So th you got to be able to run the turn. It's a, a surface, a track that emphasizes athleticism rather than Belmont Park, which emphasizes, I think, power um, because it's such a huge oval. But Tacitus runs the turn well, and I like that a great deal. And, and I think this is a horse that uh, is uh, also a big player um, uh, in Kentucky.
And again, uh, your list uh, last week, game winner was second and Roadster was fourth coming out of the San Anita Derby. That was a big performance by Roadster. We were down at Gulfstream for the Florida Derby and, and they had that sale, the two-year-old sale, the Wednesday before and Bob Baffert was in town. So I interviewed him and I said, hey, let's talk about your three-year-olds. Let's talk a little game winner, a little improbable, mucho gusto. And he said, what about Roadster? And subsequently, I talked to Frank Miramati, had him on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he said he too was talking to Baffert about three-year-olds, and Baffert brought up Roadster. So we both thought that was interesting, and it was validated by the performance in the San Anita Derby, where Roadster won and Game Winner ran second. But you still had Game Winner on top. And I'll note that, again, on the NBC broadcast yesterday, uh, Randy Moss said Game Winner is his derby horse. So he obviously was impressed by the second-place finish in the San Anita Derby. What, what was your takeaway? Well, he had a, a wide trip in that race, and he also had trouble in, in the Rebel when he got beat. He had a wide trip there. And and this is a horse who I, I think is certainly poised to take that necessary step. You know, he, he performed at a high level at two, obviously. He was the champion. He hasn't he hasn't moved beyond that. Basically, his two races this year are in this, the same performance level as his best races at two. So... When is he going to take that step that, that a three-year-old normally makes? And, and it could be in, in a couple of weeks. He certainly is a horse that uh, is, of all these, probably most eligible to uh, step forward. Um, so, yeah, I, I do like Game Winner. I, I like him more than Roadster just because he has a lot more foundation and uh, conditioning. And, and, again, he's more, um, I think, more eligible to take the, uh, the necessary leap into the winner's circle and uh, beneath that blanket of Roaches. I like Roadster, and uh, I mean, I like game winner over Roadster. And as far as improbable goes, you know, now we've seen him twice, both in the Rebel and the Arkansas Derby, kind of hang in the final 16th of a mile. Um, he didn't finish it off. Uh, he, he, had, he had aim on Omaha Beach, couldn't get by him. In the, in the Rebel Stakes, he actually made the lead and then faltered late uh, to lose that one narrowly. I'm not sure that this is a horse that really wants to go a mile and a quarter. And uh, we, we said it earlier on the show, when you talk about Roadster on the Santa Anita Derby last week in Omaha Beach, it's going to be very interesting to see where Mike Smith goes. Yes, yes, it will be. I, I, um, I would guess Omaha Beach, but um, um, obviously it's Mike's decision. Uh, you know, they're both terrific Colts, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing he goes on the hockey. I, I would think that too, but but when the trainer of the other horse is Baffert, do you, <laughs> do you want to make him mad? I, it's going to be interesting to see how that one plays out. Finally, let's uh, take a look at the, the bluegrass or talk a little bit about the bluegrass. Vacoma, I, uh, I liked Vacoma, but I will say this. He has a funny action. He looked like he was running green down the stretch, but it's just his action. He kind of uh, plods along and flops one of those uh, 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 legs out there. But I liked Vacoma. I, I thought the uh, seasonal debut down at Gulfstream was a pretty good effort. Given the layoff, um, he validated that thought with the win in the bluegrass. Win, win, win. A nice late run. Signalman uh, was a, a decent third, I thought, although did get passed late by win, win, win. But what were your thoughts coming out of the bluegrass with Vacoma? You know, when, when I first saw Vacoma, I... I... I, of course, admired his talent, but I was um, worried that with that action, he might not might not make it to the Derby um, because he paddles that left yeah. four leg. You know, it, it's really um, quite conspicuous. And uh, horses with with that kind of action usually aren't very good horses, but there have been a few. Uh, he paddles, but he paddles quickly. <laughs> so uh, I, I did like Vacoma's race because he wasn't far off a a, a lively pace in that race. And he finished the game. Uh, I thought that was a big performance. Um, I, probably, if if I if I have a bias against him, it's because of that that funny action you talked about. I also thought in that race, win 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 ran a good race. Yeah. Um, you know, he was beaten what three lengths, three and a half lengths, and he was extremely wide. He was what six wide in that race, and he was also very wide in the Tampa Bay Derby. Um, he's had two races now that I thought he, he could have won uh, with a better trip. Um, I'm not saying that, um, that he ran a better race than Vacoma, but, uh, but uh, he would have been right there with Vacoma with a, with a better trip. But he's again, might be the kind of horse who doesn't have enough um, attractability um, uh, to, to, to make a good trip for himself. Yeah, very interesting, uh, certainly. And let's just uh, quickly go back to... Uh 
a few weeks back. I, I think the, this last series of preps, the Arkansas Derby yesterday and last weekend, Bluegrass, Santa Anita Derby, and Wood gave a little definition for me to a crop that otherwise it was horses beating themselves. But some of these have now validated uh, with performances going back to back like Tacitus. But go back to that Florida Derby. Uh, again, I don't think that one settled anything with maximum security. I like the horse in there because how many three-year-olds have run triple-digit buyers so far this year? And he was one of them. So I right. liked it. But boy, the pace just played into his hands back in the Florida Derby. Yeah, you have to wonder what's going to happen in Churchill Downs, yeah. don't you? But, uh, there are horses that are uh, coming out of much uh, faster-paced races, and uh, you would have to think that they're going to show some speed. Omaha Beach, for example, Tax, who I thought ran a big race yeah. in the wood um, because the, the pace was pretty lively there, 46-4, well, and four, I think. And um, so are they going to show their speed at, at Churchill Downs? Probably, and where does that leave maximum security if he insists? on having the lead, then the question becomes, you know, can, can he, can he uh, turn in that kind of pace or run with that kind of pace and finish? And, and I'm, I'm skeptical on that count. Code of Honor, he had a rough trip in the Florida Derby and I thought was totally compromised by the pace. I'm not writing him off necessarily because he's another one of those horses that runs the turn very well. If you remember the Fountain of Youth, that's where he made his big move in the second turn there. Of course, uh, uh, Gulfstream's a mile and an eighth oval. Well, I, I'd rather see a horse do that on a one-mile oval like Churchill um, because, again, that's the oval that requires athleticism. But he's he's a nimble, nifty little horse, and, and I think he has the athleticism to be a factor there, and he's going to be a huge prize. Well, uh, we'll ask you now to give us a preview. The uh, poll, this week's poll comes out tomorrow. Uh, the older division poll, and more importantly at this time of year, the three-year-old poll. So, uh, again, you had Tacitus, game winner, Omaha Beach, Roadster, and Probable as your top five last week. Do things change up after the Arkansas Derby? A, a little bit. I, I'm, I'm going to leave Tacitus on top, and I'm going to put Omaha Beach up to second, game winner third. Um, I, I guess Roadster fourth, and obviously I have to drop um, Improbable out of there. Um, and and Vacoma certainly deserves um, deserves to be in there um, and off off his uh, bluegrass win. That was an impressive effort. And I will say, you have by my standards in the mix uh, as well. The winner. Oh yeah, uh, we didn't mention him. Yeah, yeah, of the Louisiana Derby, and I, to me that's notable because the horse. <laughs> and I lucked out yesterday. I said at the top of the show, I was keeping my fingers crossed. But Spinoff, who ran second in that Louisiana Derby, top of the stretch, I thought Spinoff was going to win. And then by my standards, kind of snuck up on the inside and, and nabbed him. But I think Spinoff, who, again, just lucked out, now sits 19 on the list with the Japanese horse 20. Uh, a better performance by one of the horses in the Lexington would have knocked my horse Spinoff out. But I think the Pletcher runner Spinoff could be interesting off of that second down in Louisiana. But as I say, you have by my standards in your mix as well. Yes, uh, he ran a big race, obviously, um, at the fairgrounds, and, and he's one of those horses that has given a performance that puts him within reach of a uh, derby-winning performance, and so is Spinoff. I was very impressed with him in that race. He had a, a, a wider trip than the winner um, and, and was just unlucky to lose. Uh, that, that was a huge effort. I, 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 you know, that... For a horse player, this is a great derby because there are horses like Spinoff and Win-Win-Win that are going to be huge prices and, and really have a chance. Yeah, it's funny. As we're talking here, they're all, it's, every one of them we're touching, I was like, well, this one's live. This one's live. It's, it, it is going to be a, a, a fun derby for sure. I, I'm anticipating. I, I, I play some uh, old man basketball on Monday nights, and uh, every week somebody will ask me about uh, the races and whatnot. We were talking about the preps and, and uh, how things are shaping up for the derby. And I said, I'm not going to be shocked at all if the favorite in the derby this year is 9-2. to two. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I, I would. I would uh, maybe even five to one. You yeah, know, yeah, because uh, it, it, it's going to be uh, favoritism at this point is uncertain, right? Uh, if I were making the line, I, I would. I would have a very tough time, and and uh, I'm sure that uh, favoritism is is uncertain, and and it'll it probably be determined by the buzz at Churchill Downs uh, that week. You know, the, 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 we're going to see some horses that go up there and 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 start uh, start thriving and, and uh, turning heads in the mornings and the buzz will will 
I think, crown the, uh, the favorite, not necessarily the winner, however. Gary, as always, uh, appreciate the conversation. Again, we'll look for the updated poll, the NTRA poll, uh, tomorrow. And uh, as I say, appreciate the visit. We'll talk again. Very good, Seth. Good talking with you as always. Gary West, and again, he's a voter on the NTRA poll. The latest poll will come out tomorrow. And now with the points, the Derby points in the books, it's going to be interesting to see where people go and how it does shake out. I think it's going to be Roadster and or Omaha Beach on top. Yeah, you would definitely have to think one of them, and one of them is most likely going to be the favorite in the Kentucky yeah. Derby. So uh, it's going to be interesting, and I think a lot of that's going to have to do with the favoritism in the Derby. It's going to, a lot's going to have to do with where Mike Smith goes. It's going to be yeah. very, very yeah. interesting yeah. to see where he's going to end up. So, uh, And as you said, that you made a good point there. You don't really want to make – uh, Bob Baffert, man, you, you guys have had a lot of success together, including last year and uh, way before Justify even was around. So um, it's going to be really, really interesting. He's got a tough choice to make. Yeah, we've seen that before where uh, these jockeys have had choices going into big races between the, the guy who trains their bread and butter or the really talented runner. And somehow they end up on the bread and butter horse because over time, uh, that's going to play out for you. But it, it'll be intriguing. I, t- to me, Omaha Beach may be the, the way I would go if I was a jockey, disregarding any of the other factors. Mm-hmm. But I don't think you can disregard the other horses trained by Bob Affer. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be tough as well, especially, you know, there, there, there should be some – more speed than usual in this derby, and Roadster likes to come from off the pace. So, uh, again, it's a really big choice for Mike Smith. It's going to be a lot of fun the next uh, couple of weeks as we uh, head towards Louisville and the Kentucky Derby the next few weeks. And uh, as Gary said, see how they work out and and get some of those notes as well. Uh, See if some horses maybe go by the wayside and a couple of bubble horses move in or not. Uh, It's going to be a lot of fun. But now we've kind of settled who we can focus on so we can now start to – at least uh, make those notes and do a little little pre-studying and whatnot. All right, we'll wrap things up for uh, this edition of Racing Across America. Don't forget, coming up on Friday, a $500 bankroll here at the Clubhouse Racebook. I'll have $500 to play on behalf of the bankroll team, and we always want to see you down here because it's more fun with the more people there are. That's 711 Central Avenue in Albany. If you're on the team, at the end of the day, we split up all the money. Good, a couple of weeks ago, I think everybody walked away with $22 or something. But again, we were live to that that pick four. One of the pick four, uh, pick five, excuse me, one of the pick five payoffs, everybody was going to walk away with, I think, $150. Um, so that would have been nice. But everybody walked away with a little, little extra change in their pocket. And you can come down and see if you can get on the team on Friday. Love to see you here, 7-Eleven Central Avenue in Albany. And again, there was a Fan Appreciation Day coming up next Saturday. Samson's Easy Bet in Castleton. Love to see you there so we can say thank you to you next Saturday afternoon. Sully, good luck this afternoon. And good luck to you. And good luck to all of you. I'll be back in a couple hours with OTB Live. We'll see you then. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.